you much. So it is my pleasure and privilege to introduce our hospital medicine visiting professor, Dr. Kirsten Kennedy. Yeah, Kirsten comes to us from UAB, where she is the chief medical officer for UAB Hospital. She was previously the chief of hospital medicine. She established a bedside procedure service, did a whole bunch of quality improvement projects. I've got a long introduction here that Kirsten was kind to share with us. She said, it's okay if I just say she's a star in hospital medicine. <laughs> in our working group for visiting professors, Aaron Kim and the working group did a great job you know, bringing her here for this conversation. So we're really looking forward to this. Well, thank you. Thanks for being here. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate the invitation. Um, I did not tell him to say I was a star. Right? <laughs> and told him he just didn't have to read all of that. Let me get myself set up here. I'm not going to sit the whole time. I'm sit for a second while I get myself all set up. Um, all right, so a couple of things. We are doing this hybrid, and that is A-OK -okay with me. Like, I'm totally comfortable with that. Um, yesterday, I spent a lot of time talking at the residence. I apologize. Today, I'm going to make you talk to me. <laughs> so we're going to do some interaction and we can do that via Zoom too. So here are my rules. Like there's, this is a safe space. Um, if you're eating, it's okay to turn on your camera. It only feels awkward to you. No one really sees it. Um, if you're at home in your pajamas and there are children running around or pets, like kudos to you. You're living your best life. You are my people turn your camera on because it doesn't bother me. Like I would love it, but it was, you know, I just want everyone to feel comfortable and feel like we can really interact here. Um, so first and foremost, maybe I'll use this. Oh, I have no financial disclosures. It's not for lack of trying, but I, I will be at work tomorrow. So nothing that I need to share with you there. Um, so why am I talking about leadership? You know, one of the things that I worried a little bit about is you get invited to come and do a grand rounds and typically grand rounds are very heavy clinically and there's a lot of science. And I mean, I decided I wasn't going to do that because <laughs> anybody can come and talk to you. Well, not anybody, but someone I'm sure will come and talk to you about heart failure management. Right? You're going to get that from somewhere. I don't think that's what I bring. Like I like to come and talk about the stuff that people probably aren't really going to talk about. I'm going to present some uh, some ideas to you that I want you to sit with. And the reason why I want to talk about leadership, I'm very passionate about leadership uh, for a couple of reasons. Number one, because as I talked about yesterday with the residents, leadership really saved my career. Like I really just thought I was in the wrong place. I did not want to be a doctor like this was not for me. And it was really understanding leadership, not necessarily like being CMO, but it was understanding leadership, what it is, what it looks like, how you apply it, that really rejuvenated me, it gave me this renewed energy and this renewed like enthusiasm for the work. The other reason why I really like talking about leadership is because I think it is sorely misunderstood, which is why I think this is a worthwhile topic to bring to everybody. So I have some objectives. They're easy. They're simple, right? I want you to understand the premise of leadership. Um, I want you to appreciate how defining a vision can influence your environment. And when you leave here, I want you to have steps for how you can fully step into your leadership. Um, so first, I'm going to start with a question. I'm going to mess with Zoom a little bit so I can see you all. Um, how many of you are in leadership? Show of hands. Uh, all right, I see Tegan, Susan, Hassan. All right, I see a couple people in here. Anybody else in leadership? I saw Shu for a second. Hi, good to see you. You can also like raise your hand using the feature on Zoom, but yeah. Okay. Joanna, hi, Joanna. It's good to see you. All right. <laughs> Teresa. You owe me a call. Okay. So I, I would actually argue that all of you should have raised your hands. And this is why I talk about how leadership is misunderstood. Um, and so when you leave here, I want that, that reaction to be different the next time someone asks you that, right? Because I think most of the times when we think about leadership, we think about titles. Like I'm sure everyone that raised their hand has some sort of title. 
But that, in fact, is not what leadership is at all. Leadership, Joyce and I were talking on the drive over. Leadership, I think a lot of people think leadership is about authority. It's not. And as a CMO, God, like, I will tell you, I had envisioned, first of all, this amazing office, all right, with a beautiful <laughs> view, <laughs> my own parking space, right? Um, and just unlimited authority. Like, I was just going to come in and tell everybody what to do, but they would just do it because I'm the CMO, you know? And um, I mean, my office is cool, but it's not what I had envisioned. I definitely do not have my own parking space. In fact, I fight with people every morning because there's a parking space that I like, and there's like this one person that tries to park there every day. It's petty, but like you don't get your own parking space, and there's like zero authority. Almost everything is influence. Right? I was telling her, I feel like the CMO position is literally leadership at its pinnacle because it helps you understand what leadership truly is, right? So I asked Chat GPT, right? Best friend, how would you define leadership? So leadership is the ability to inspire, guide, and influence others toward a common goal or vision. You don't see the word control, you don't see the word authority. You don't see the word power. It really is about being able to create a vision, get other people inspired by it, and convince them to want to go there. Convince them to see that finish line as their finish line as well. Right? Reality is everyone has a vision. Like you may be thinking, well, that's, yeah, like if you're the chief, you've got a vision, but you have a vision too. If you think about every day that you get up and you come to work, subconsciously, you have a vision for how you want your day to go, right? You want it to be a good day. You want to come, you want to see the patients, you don't want any drama, you know? You want to get all your notes done. You want to be out by a certain time so you can go get your kids. That in and of itself is a vision, right? So then the question is, how are you moving yourself and others toward that vision? Well, sometimes when I think about that, like if my vision is that I want to have a good day, I'm walking through the hallway, I'm intentionally smiling at people. I'm intentionally saying hello, right? I'm setting the conditions for that vision to happen. I'm influencing my environment. Like I am deciding what the environment is. And I have an uncle that used to talk about the difference between being a thermostat and being a thermometer. You heard about that? <laughs> so the thermostat sets the temperature of the room. The thermometer reads it. Okay. So you want to be the thermostat. So when I come on service, I am the thermostat for that unit. I come on and I dictate the temperature on the unit because it aligns with my vision. I enjoy clinical service more when it's a positive environment, when we're all working together, when people are in a good mood. I think patients get better care when we do that. Like that is a vision in and of itself. Now, sometimes I fall short. It's usually when my stretch is too long. Uh, but this is a testament to the fact that I am the thermostat. One of our case managers um, will bring chocolate to me when we get toward the end of the stretch. Like I've literally come into the room where we do our multidisciplinary rounds and there's like a pile of chocolate there. And she's just like, I just want her to be happy. <laughs> <laughs> but as a leader, not as a CMO, as a leader, I, I change the air in the room. And you all do that too, whether you realize it or not. For most of us in medical school, in PA school, in nursing school, we are not taught much about leadership, especially as physicians. We're not taught that we are leaders, but someone is looking up to you to dictate how the day goes. They're looking to you not just to dictate the care for the patient, but you are actually going to decide how the care is delivered, the vibe which, with, with which the care is delivered. And so that's why we all have to be thinking about that when we think about leadership. So I'll give you some examples, keeping the chat GPT definition of the bomb so you don't forget it, right? You're doing this right now, whether you realize it or not. When you talk to a patient and you ask them to change their diet, you start talking to them about some small dietary changes they can, they can make. Like I love talking to patients about how like, You've got CHF, you've got to control your sodium intake. There's hidden sodium everywhere, you know, and it's hard. So what are some ways, what are some simple ways that we can reduce some of the sodium? We don't do canned goods, 
from here forward, we don't do canned vegetables. We do frozen vegetables. Price is about the same. It's not floating in a pool of sodium so that it can, you know, stay fresh for three years. Um, like that is leadership. I'm guiding this patient toward a vision. My vision for them is them being healthier, them not getting admitted to the hospital over and over again with volume overload. When you tell a patient to commit to a small habit change that's gonna get them to remember to take their medications, put your medicines by your toothbrush. You know you're gonna get up and brush your teeth every day, right? As soon as you finish brushing your teeth, pop that pill. That's leadership, right? Without a title, that is leadership. Setting the tone for the care team, what I talked about when I come into the multidisciplinary rounds room, right? I recognize, I have seen the difference in how the day goes when I come in in a good mood and when I come in and I'm not in a great mood. So much so that they now bring me chocolate so that I will be, <laughs> right? Like that's an example of leadership. And then you see it in teaching. And this one's super easy, so I'm only gonna give you one example. But when you guide a junior resident or a medical student, any sort of trainee, and I'm not just talking about teaching them like how to, you know, how to work up AKI. But when you start guiding them on how to really connect with patients, you have a vision for how you want them to be as a physician, right? You have a vision for how you want them to be as a licensed professional when they finish. You're guiding them toward that. You're inspiring them. You're not doing it through brute force, right? That in and of itself is leadership. Now, somebody does not believe me still. So I'm going to give you the opposite example because some people are leading unintentionally with negative results. Or as I like to say, they're using their leadership for evil. So um, as chief of hospital medicine, I would see this all the time. So if I institute some change, I remember when we created our new relief system, there were people that didn't like it. And so they would get into the work office and they would talk about how stupid it was, how much they didn't like it. Those people are leading. They have a vision for how it should be, right? So they are trying to influence and inspire people around them to see it the way that they see it so that they will also push back, right? Those people are my people. Like I go find those people and I go connect with those people because they don't know it, but they are leaders just like I am, right? So there's this idea that leaders are somehow different. They're somehow a different phenotype. They're other. We really all are. And so it's figuring out how can we be intentional in our leadership? So. Here's where I want you to talk to me. What do you believe is the fundamental task of leaders? Like finish this sentence for me. Somebody read my mind. And I'm checking the chat. So somebody can throw it in the chat if you'd like to. What's the fundamental task of, of leaders? Martin wants to tell me. To motivate. To motivate. What else? Coach. The coach. I like that. Oh, I got some chat action to serve. Yes. Inspire. Come on, chat GPT. <laughs> <laughs> what else? Help to unify people. To unify people. That's perfect. To grow people. Thank you, Karen. Oh, somebody else was in the chat. Let me open it back up. To help your team thrive. This is the one. Sonia, this is the one, to meet goals as a team, to be supportive, to hold space for people. Come on, Kalisha. All right, to thread the needle between accomplishing an objective and fostering professional development. I love that, Marianne. Yeah, I think this is, Sonia's though resonates with me most and it resonates with Daniel Goldman. If y'all are familiar with Daniel Goldman, he wrote Primal Leadership. And Daniel Goldman would argue here, let me move this. that the fundamental task of leaders is to prime good feeling in those that they lead, right? And that occurs when a leader creates resonance, a reservoir of positivity that frees the best in people. So when I talk about making sure that we meet our vision for the day, that we have a good day, that we deliver optimal care, it really is all about just changing the feeling. It's changing the air in the room, right? Now, I think the reason why people don't raise their hands in part is because we have conflated leadership and management. They are two very different things, right? Management is focused on what needs to get done. It's the planning, it's directing people, it's telling them what to do, it's checking the boxes. And that relies on authority. Leadership is focused on people. 
it is actually getting people to want to follow you, right? It's not, it's not like making them do it. It's motivating them, as someone said, right? Oh, that's huge. Motivating people. It's listening to people. And it's really leaning on influence. My argument is that most of our organizations are being overmanaged and underled. You don't have enough people inspiring you. You don't have enough people priming the conditions of the room, making you want to be there, making you want to go where they go, right? A good leader will make you run through a brick wall for them, right? Not because you enjoy hitting bricks, but because you believe in the vision. You're inspired enough to go there, right? That is what we're trying to get to. And my argument is that every one of you have an obligation to do that. By nature of where you sit, you are leading and you have an obligation to step into that. So I want you to consider this. This article came out, um, I forget the year. It was really interesting because this, this aligns for me as a quality person, as someone who's passionate about leadership, right? And they asked the question is whether physician leadership would affect hospital quality, efficiency, and financial performance, right? And what they found was that hospitals and physician-led hospital systems had better quality rankings. It didn't necessarily impact the finances, but it definitely impacted quality and it impacted efficiency. So here's the next place I want to talk to you. What does it mean to be physician led? What comes to mind for you? And there are no wrong answers. What comes to mind for you? What does it mean to be a physician led organization? To lead with the goal of like optimizing patient care outcomes and experiences. I like that. Lance was gonna first have to be sitting at the table. Oftentimes they're not sitting at the table during critical decisions. So having positions at the table. What else? Ankit, I felt like it was right there. You were gonna say something. Yeah. I think that's probably part of it, but I think realistically, you can't have physicians as a CEO for every organization, right? So if, if that is truly what they meant, I mean, I don't know, if that is truly what they meant, then we're all limited. Our medical centers are going to be limited because that's just not likely to be the reality. But I would argue that your organization can be physician-led because you're leading from wherever you are, right? I mean, if you think about it, that person in the workroom that's griping about whatever change just came up, they're pretty powerful. They can completely dismantle whatever initiative you put in place. I will tell people when they talk about authority and, oh, you're CMO, you just tell me what to do. Listen, and I don't mean this offensively, but anybody with two brain cells can figure out how to put them together to destroy my project if I make them mad enough. Like, it doesn't take much, right? So do you have to be in the C-suite to start leading? Do you have to be in the C-suite to start changing outcomes? I think it's more what you said. I really do. I think it's about physicians who care about outcomes with their patients and not just physicians, because I got some PAs in here. I think in general, it's clinicians who are at the front line, who care about the outcomes of their patients, who understand the intricacies of delivering the care that are showing up with intention and leading. Everyone is showing up with the intent to have positive outcomes. Everyone has the shared vision for what healthcare should look like. I think we're struggling if we start waiting until we get to a title role to start leading. I think we'll be in trouble, right? All right, so here's my, oh wait, did someone talk to me in here? No, that's fine. All right, so here's my goal. I wanna give you some steps for how you can use your leadership for good and not evil. Because as we've established, all of you are leading either intentionally or unintentionally. So I want you to be intentional about your leadership going forward. And here are some steps. Number one, you've got to understand your why. If you haven't taken some time to pause and think about why it is that you are here, really what your mission is. So when we talk about vision, vision is the finish line, right? Like I will say as a leader, my job is to envision the finish line. And then I'm here to paint the picture of what the finish line looks like. And then you tell me how we get there. Are we driving? Are we biking? You know, as long as we get to the finish line, it doesn't matter. That's vision. Mission is your why. Mission is what you're here to do. 
right? And all of us have our own mission. And if we don't take time to figure out what that is, it's really difficult to be intentional in your leadership because you're just kind of floating and going by, right? Um, the second thing is you've got to get to know yourself. And that's beyond just mission. That's trying to make sure you understand who you are as a person, what makes you tick, both positively and negatively, right? what you are passionate about, what your hard lines are. And it leads me to one of the things that I love talking about, which is emotional intelligence, which I think really was a game changer for me in my career. If you look, if we could graph my career trajectory at the point where I really got a handle on this emotional intelligence thing, it just went straight up. And I don't know if that's good or bad, because there are some days where I really question my life choices, like in this position. But if your goal is to move forward, because not everybody's interested in being in leadership roles. And again, that's not what this talk is about. But if your goal is to move forward, then I want you to really pay attention here because this is the ticket. So emotional intelligence starts first and foremost with understanding who you are, and that is self-awareness. So that's thinking about my emotional self-awareness, like what makes me upset, right? And then having an accurate self-assessment. Why am I upset? This person said something. Is it really about them? Is it about me? Is it something in the tone? Are they taking me back to something like from my childhood? Like, why am I worked up by, uh, by this? Once you understand yourself, once you have an accurate self-assessment of what it is that you're feeling, now you can get into self-management, right? You can control how you respond to it. So I'll give you a great example. My husband is, uh, is a military, career military guy. And he would say things that make me so upset and I finally got to say, like, why is it that it bothers me so much? Because my dad was also Air Force. My dad was also very military. And they are very direct and authoritarian. And I realized that when he's saying things, he's just saying it. But it reminds me of my dad talking to me. And so it feels condescending, even though his intent is not to be condescending. That takes some emotional self-awareness and an accurate self-assessment that is actually not him talking to me sideways. It's me taking it sideways because of something else. Now I can show up differently. Now I can respond differently to him. We don't have to have an argument about that. I can control my reaction. I can also adapt, right? I can figure out how I might need to move differently in those situations so that we don't have conflict, right? All right, step three, you gotta leverage your strengths and then later you'll dive into your opportunities. So I feel like usually we, we focus a lot on I won't call them weaknesses, but on our opportunities. And I'm going to ask you to look at that a little differently. Where you have strengths, it's really, really important to fo first focus on highlighting those and leveraging those. So if you find that you are someone who's really good at connecting with people, but you're not really good with like following up on the details, that's okay. Like first, I want you to really dive head first into connecting with people. With every interaction, I want you to think about how do I leverage the strength that I have? Oh, don't expire on me. Okay. No, don't do that. Um, because that really will help you start to be intentional about how you use it and where you use it. And then as you go along, once you've really started to leverage your strengths, you'll have an opportunity to dive into your opportunities. But what you also may find is that your opportunities or your weaknesses exist because you're putting yourself in situations where you're not strong, right? Like maybe you're dabbling over somewhere where you don't need to be. You need to be over here where you can really use your strengths more than anything, right? Now, how do you know your strengths? Well, there are a lot of different resources that allow you to do that. People familiar with the DISC? This is a great one, right? They also have DISC for leaders. So the analysis report that you get back is specifically around how your disc relates to the way that you lead people and the way that people react to you. I love that one. I go back to it all the time. I go to it with my direct reports. I'll give you a great example. Um, I have one direct report that I felt like every time I bring something to them, it's always sort of telling me why it wouldn't work, you know? And you can tell from my personality, I'm not a like what doesn't work kind of girl. I'm like, what does work? Let me tell you all that we could be. And so I found that really frustrating. And then I thought, I wonder where he is on this disc. And as it turns out, he's a really high S. So he will move, he'll change, but he likes to keep things steady. And so it's very anxiety provoking when I start going in like with this new vision, trying to change everything. And he'll eventually get there, but he takes time to really sit and think about it. 
as you can imagine, I'm a DI. So I'm dominant. I'll get in there and I'm influential. I want to talk to you. I want to share the vision. I want to bring you along with me. Like that's just very different from him. And so we actually had a conversation around it where I was like, I get that you're a high ass, right? You don't like seeing things change. Not that you're opposed to it, but you, you're thinking about all the ways this could go wrong. This creates a little anxiety for you. I want you to process how you need to process. But then when you finish processing with me so that you don't leave the meeting with me feeling like you just like completely discounted everything, I want you to pivot to what's possible. I want you to try at the very end after you've laid all these fears out, tell me what you think might be possible. So this is a great resource, not just for understanding who you are and how you take, but then also being able to figure out how to interact with other people. Another good one is Strength Finders. If you're not familiar with it, um, it's one that I would recommend so that again, you can figure out what your strengths are. We're not focusing on weaknesses right now. We're focusing on strengths. We're going to figure out how to bring that to every encounter and how to leverage that. And then another one is 360 evaluations. I don't think we do enough of these. Do y'all do 360s? When you're not in trouble? <laughs> right. So the worst part is to wait. Hold on, let me see here. Did anybody talk to me in the chat? Y'all do 360s on Zoom? Yeah. Karen does. Okay. I think oftentimes we wait until someone's in trouble to do a 360 evaluation. And you actually don't want to do that. You actually want to try to do that on a regular basis if you can. Oh, somebody's talking to me. Oh, Jada, hi. She has done them. Louisa's done them. Yes, Lauren Collins. Hey, Tracy Henry. <laughs> I haven't seen you. Yeah, so 360s are really great. If you're not familiar with them, basically you go and you um, provide an objective party with the names of people that work all around you. So think about a circle. like So it's not just asking your boss what they think about you or the people who report to you, but it's the people that work alongside you every day. And you get them to fill out this survey, sort of evaluating the way that you show up. And it's really eye-opening. It can also be very stressful. <laughs> I'll admit that too. Right. But remember, flowers need both sun and rain to grow. Right. So we, we take them both. The beauty of it is people will identify blind spots to you that you could never see on your own. There's no way for you to see that because it's about perception and you can't control how other people perceive you necessarily. You do want to have that knowledge. You can have that awareness and it may help help you adapt in circumstances. But there's no way for you to no matter how self-aware you are, figure that stuff out without asking someone else. So 360 evaluations are really a great resource for trying to figure out like, what exactly am I good at? And what are some things that maybe I could, I could work on later? The fourth thing is to get curious about other people. So it's funny, I was talking to Idris yesterday, one of the residents, um, and we were talking about this concept of, you know, um, it's an aspect of leadership. I don't remember the exact details. Um, but he was asking me about difficult conversation, you know? And it was a really good question. And then we started to branch out and talk about some other things. And we start getting into, you know, how as a CMO, I often have to get people to move someplace that they don't necessarily want to move, right? They're comfortable where they are. And so how do I do that? The first thing I do is I try to listen to them. And not because I want them to feel good about me listening to them, although people do feel good about that, but because I'm listening to hear what matters to them. Like, I want to understand what's important to them. What do they need? What are they passionate about? What's their priority? Because I'm trying to figure out where I can get aligned with them. Because if I can somehow figure out how to align my priority with their priority, they will help me push my boulder up the hill because it's where they need to go too. So you really want to start getting curious about other people. I even do this in difficult um, encounters. One time, the most beautiful way that I saw it done was from one of our cardiologists, who's just a delightful human in general, but there was a nurse that on the phone um, was really being short with him. And he just like stopped the conversation. He was like, is everything okay, right? 
And it kind of disarmed her. And in fact, it had been a really difficult shift. But that is just a small example of how when you start getting curious about other people, it opens this door for you to be really intentional about your leadership. It opens the door for you to start to change the temperature in the room. Um, this goes back to emotional intelligence. Again, you're not going to get away from it if you come hang out with me because I love to talk about it, right? And that is social awareness, which is the next, the next piece of it. And that is empathy. Right? You can't understand other people unless you start talking to them and listening to them. And then you start to understand what's driving them, what's what's bothering them. right? And you start to gain over time, as you get better with this empathy thing, you start to gain what we call situational awareness, which is not just me being able to understand what you're feeling, but me starting to be able to understand what the room is feeling. right? So now I can start to read the room. And I tell people all the time at Leadership Academy, if you can read the room, you can leave the room, right? If you can't, then you're lost. It's no difference than me, you know, I'm going to give, what's your name? Kimberly. Kimberly. What's your name? Elizabeth. Elizabeth, I can't do both. I love you. I love you both because you came up here. What's your, what's your name? Mary. Mary. All right, we're going we're gonna to split you up. Y'all are my first two people here. All right, Kimberly, Mary, I need you to run across the field to get to the other side. There are landmines on your way. <laughs> Kimberly, you get a map of the landmines. Mary, I'm sorry, you came in, you came in later than they did. You don't get any. <laughs> Who's making it to the other side of the field with their legs? <laughs> Kimberly. Moving the map. That's you, right? <laughs> but that's what situal situational awareness is, right? So when you walk into a room and you can pick out where the landmines are, you know how to navigate around them. So the people that end up in these really difficult situations where they feel like they bomb, they don't know where the landmines are because they haven't figured out how to read the room. That starts first with empathy. Empathy starts first with getting curious about other people. And you can do that at any point, any time on a shift. If you sense something, just start asking questions, right? All right. And then the last thing is you need to be intentional. You have to show up with the expectation that you're here to lead. Right. And if no one has told you that before, I am telling you today, when you walk out of here and you go back to your clinical work, I want you to walk on that unit being intentional about the fact that you are there to lead. People are expecting it. It's your duty for you to go out there and for you to lead them. And that gets to the last part of emotional intelligence, and that is relationship management. If you've got all of these other things, you can influence other people. You can foster teamwork and collaboration. And most importantly, you can manage conflict, right? Because now you've got the tools. You've got the foundation to be able to do that. So let me ask you guys a question. I want you to think of a leader that you really admire. Just take a minute. Think about somebody that you really, really admire as a leader. And I want you to share with me one thing about that person that makes them so admirable to you. And Zoom, I'm looking at you too. I'm, I'm checking the chat here. Think about that one leader that you really admire. Tegan says this person is passionate and driven. Now, you know, if the Zoom is talking to y'all, aren't talking to them. There's no way around it. What's that? Invested. They're invested. I love that. Humility. What's that? Humility. Humility. Yes. That's a good one. They're inviting. They're inviting. Authentic, meet people, where meet people where they are. Who said that? I like that. I got a lot in the chat. Honest, boldness, caring, authentic, someone who actively listens, love that. Wants to hear what I have to say. Yep. Isn't rushed again. Someone who's listening, who's attentive and present, approachable, integrity, understanding of dynamic circumstances and people and flexes accordingly. Lauren, that's emotional intelligence right there. Relatable, what else? Somebody else in here was gonna tell me something. The warm. Mm. Warm. Yes, relatable. I think I said that one. Yeah. Now, what if you took that, wait, Dan, who's that one leader you admire? What's that one thing? You didn't talk to me the whole time. <laughs> They're steady. I'm glad you said that. 
Because the one leader that comes to mind for me is someone who is always calm. I don't think I've ever seen them frazzled. Just completely unflappable. So now what if you've got your leader in mind and you've got that one thing about them, what if at every encounter you showed up and you tried to bring that one thing to your interactions? What might that look like? You don't have to say it out loud. You just kind of think about it. Like, what would it look like if everywhere you showed up, you were warm? If with every encounter, you were steady, you were intentional, you were thinking about how can I be steady in this moment? How can I be relatable in this moment? How can I be actively listening in this moment, right? What if we all showed up that way? I would argue that things would look very different in our hospital. But, and we can take a moment I'm not going to ask anybody to call it out but we've all had moments where we haven't shown up in our best ways you know we haven't shown up as our best selves if you were if one of your titled leaders if that person that you had in your mind showed up in that same way how would you feel you'd be appalled right what is different between them and you if it's the title, throw that out. You should all be showing up as leaders. You should all be coming to every encounter in that way, title or not. Yeah. I uh, It's funny, I was talking to Moni about, I used to give a, um, a talk every year to the residents about consults, and I get real fired up about consults because I think that is the perfect place to lead, and people often are not leading, or they're doing it unintentionally. And remember that unintentional leadership can often go negative. But when you are on consults, if there are any trainees on the line, I don't know if there are, but when you're on consults, let's say you're on cardiology, because Martin's in here, um, you're on cardiology consults. When someone pages and you call them back, you are the face of cardiology in that moment. Like You may not think about it. You're like, I'm just a resident on my shift waiting to like get to my off day. But in reality, you are the door, you are the gateway to cardiology. So in that moment, you are the face of cardiology. If the chief of cardiology behaved on that call, the way that you get ready to behave, what would you think about that person? Right? I view every single one of you as leaders. And I want you to think about that every time you get into an interaction. It will change your outcomes at your hospital. It will change your interactions within your hospital. It will make your day go better. It will make people show up differently. You will be the thermostat in every room that you walk into and not the thermometer, right? So now, quick reflection question. What, if anything, you might do new, enhanced, or improved based on hearing all this today? And you do have to talk to me for this one, but I'm gonna make you talk about when you didn't show up the way you should have, but you do have to talk to me here. What, if anything, could you do differently? Or might you be inspired to do differently going forward? Consistency. Tell me more about that. Um, I guess just, like you said, being mindful of the way that I'm being perceived and the, the influence that I have on the people around me and just being very intentional about that yeah. um, every day. Yeah, this is that was excellent. Consistency. Smile more. <laughs> it's a small thing, you know, but it changes the air in the room. What else? I think we get in a culture or a mindset where we're afraid to ask questions mm -hmm. if we're unsure. And so I think for me personally, um, just asking questions. If I'm unsure or don't know the expectation, just ask. Yes. Yes. That way you can do what is expected of you. That's after. right. That's right. God, we if we all ask a few more questions, not just as it pertains to like procedure and doing things, but just understanding other people, like what they mean by the things that they say, like that clarity alone would improve relationships. And to all of those quote titled leaders, 
or more senior people that are on Zoom or in the room, you asking questions and modeling that changes the conditions and allows other people to do it, right? All right, what else? Somebody in this Zoom room, somebody needs to say something. It's so quiet. <laughs> What else? Anything that you might do new, or maybe it's not new, you just might enhance it because you already had some of this, or improved. Sometimes the inquiry leads to coaching others on the team. That's right. And coaching is powerful, right? Coaching is powerful. What else? I like the example you gave when the uh... So it was the cardiology attending was you know the nurse was being shown before. Mm -hmm. You just stopped and asked, hey, like, how's your day going? You know, like, is everything okay? Yeah, that's the question. Um, and so that goes back mm -hmm. to that principle of you saying, uh, being curious about people and what's going on at the junction. Yeah. So that's something that I'll like. Yeah. I think that's really powerful. I think the, the questions change your mindset from being focus on so often we get into like the quick kind of heuristic of we have to make a judgment call and we when we move into a question of being curious mm -hmm. there's something about being curious that i think opens your mind up to interpersonal situations and clinical situations in a different way Absolutely. yeah well said less accusatory more like you know inviting inquisitive Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Great. What else? And Zoom, you can come off uh, mute and just say it if you want to. You don't have to type it. Kind of related to everything, maybe just slowing down, making it time to learn more little things in the hospital, whether it's a nurse or um, a janitor in the hallways, just mm -hmm. addressing people by their needs. Using more like mirroring techniques. Yeah. Help for people that aren't familiar with mirroring. Tell them, tell them a little more about that. Um, I'll try to say it shortly. Yeah. Um, I learned about it from a master class talk on negotiation. And basically, when you're listening to someone, the last couple of words that they say, mm -hmm. repeat the words that they use back to them so that they know that you're listening to them. And then also, like, physical mirroring as well but, mm -hmm. um, and using fewer I statements as well. Yeah. It's a really great master class. Anything else? Do more of what you're doing right now, which is just listen. Mm -hmm. Well, I appreciate you all entertaining me and entertaining these ideas. Um, I don't think it's a typical grand rounds, but I, I don't know. I think we kind of need more of this. I think we need more of it. And I wonder what it will look like um, for those that do feel like there's something that they can take away from this that's new or enhanced or something that they can be intentional about. I would, I'd love to stay in touch. And if you see a difference, um, I'd like for you to email me sometime and tell me if you notice it. I will tell you, I have... Um, I feel strongly about this because I've done this myself. I've started to be more intentional about the way that I show up. I've started to be more intentional about how I influence the tone in any given interaction, both with angry patients and with, you know, exhausted health staff and with, you know, stretched thin nurses. Like I've really tried to be intentional and I will tell you that my clinical shifts are so much easier because of this. I can tell you I can get people working together so much better. And then outside of that, 
when I'm in my leadership roles, when I'm in meetings, when I'm interacting with people on the administrative side, it's the same thing. And I don't see why you can't apply this in your lab if you're a researcher. I don't see any reason why you can't apply this at home with your families. So I'll take any questions if you have them, but thank you for your time. And Zoom, I'll take any questions from you if you have them too. Thank you, Tegan. You've been very interactive this whole time. I really appreciate, <laughs> I appreciate you. <laughs> I have a question. Of course. First and foremost, thank you so much for your presentation here. And thank you for not being afraid to step outside the box of your traditional um, grand rounds and more so focus on um, what's useful. Um, yeah. well, thank you. Trying to do things traditional. Uh, I kind of have a two part question, if that's okay. Of course. Um, so my question is as you got into your leadership roles and being seen moments and things like that, what was the single most uh, useful thing, whether it was a course or a book or something that you did that helped you master the skills that you feel like get better at the skills that you talked about today. Mm -hmm. And then the second part of my question is, do you care to share a time where you like completely finally dropped the ball and how did that transform your leadership style? Oh, yeah. Wow. First of all, stay on my business. Okay. Now, now I'm about to have to tell a story that doesn't look so good. Okay, so I, when I first became the director of quality, I had a really, really negative inter interaction with, um, with the position. And um, it could have been very minor, right? It was it's a nocturnist, and I know nights are busy, and they're stressful, and you're tired, and you're trying to get out. But, you know, just in a rush, didn't start the home meds, didn't start the diet, you know, patient ended up, patient had AFib, ended up like going into RVR, son was super upset. And so I decided, I'm going to give him, I'm going to let him know what, just give him some feedback. And I thought I was framing it in like the best way I was, I started out by saying, hey, I know your job is tough. I know it's busy at night. I know it happens, you know, and then I tried to be helpful, like, hey, like in the future, if you're if you're slammed in the morning and you're rushing to get out, like you can tell me what still needs to be done and I'll take care of it for you. And I mean, he just did not respond well to it at all. Like really was confrontational about it. And I feel like in that moment, what I should have done was first of all, check my own vitals, right? Like, cause I'm starting to get worked up cause I worked so hard to say this nicely, jerk. Like, and now you're blowing up at me, you know? So I wish that I would have slowed down. And the biggest thing is I wish that I had gotten curious. Instead of responding to what he was saying, which started to get really sort of accusatory and you're like this and you're like that. If I could have just ignored all of that and just like gotten curious and started asking him some questions and like really change the temperature, like bend the thermostat. I think that interaction would have gone so much better. Instead, you know, we were both in there being the thermometer. We were both in there raising the temperature, you know, because we both thought we were right. Um, and that is, is an interaction that I am, I won't say embarrassed by because it taught me a lot, you know, um, but it was not my best work and it sticks with me. And I remember that when I find myself in situations where like it's starting to get heated. And mm -hmm. even though I feel like I'm right, a lot of times I'm right, okay? <laughs> in a lot of situations I'm right. I have to remind myself that it's not about being right, right? It's about me controlling the temperature. I am the thermostat in here, right? So it's about me controlling what happens here. And so I have to set the tone. And usually the way that I do that is with silence. It's with listening and it's with getting real curious about the other person. Like what's really underneath this, right? So some of the ways that I've gotten better at that, um, number one, believe it or not, this is gonna feel like I'm a, a used car salesman because I'm the course director for SHM's Leadership Academy, but really Leadership Academy was really transformational. I learned a lot through going through Leadership Academy that I felt like really helped me so much so that I remember when I came back from it, I said, you know, we need to invest in sending our leaders to Leadership Academy. So we built that into the budget where if you were in a titled leadership role, 
Like your ex the expectations that you're going to go through Leadership Academy and we're going to pay for it, right? Because that's our investment in you because you were here working for us and providing good leadership. But now that we've almost gotten all of our title leaders through the Leadership Academy, the money is not going away. Now what I've said is every hospitalist needs to go through the Leadership Academy, whether you want to be in a leadership role or not. You don't ever have to want to be in a leadership role, but there are some key principles about the way that you show up that influences the way that care is being delivered on units. And I think everyone needs to understand that. So that was really big for me. As far as books, Emotional Intelligence 2.0 by Travis Bradbury is a really great book. It was um, it, it provides a nice introduction to emotional intelligence, but most importantly, it's almost like a workbook. So it gives you um, some almost like a, a roadmap for how you can start to improve because you do this assessment and you figure out where you probably have the most opportunity and it helps you identify someone who's strong in the areas that you are not so that they can help you gain that skill. So for me as a high D, I can be very reactive. Um, my eight-year-old is the same way. She's very smart. And the worst thing you can do is take a capable person and make them a high D, right? Because they, they will just react in the moment. Something happens, let me just take care of it. Right. I don't want to slow down because I, I can just I can do it. Most times I can I can get it done. But usually the results aren't great. Right. As far as the tone that you set, like you may get it done, but you might like, you know, roll some people over in the process of doing it. And so one of the things that I really had to work on is slowing down. Right. Somebody sends me an email. I don't have to respond to that right now. I'm going to intentionally let it breathe. Right. And then I'll respond to it later. And even in interactions with people, someone says something, I don't have to respond to that right now. Let it sit for a second. I might ask you a question and then I'll just listen to you. You know, that gives me some time so that I can respond better. But th those are the ways that I was able to work on that is through that book. It talks about finding someone who's really good at that. And I was able to go to that person and say, hey, I need your help. How do you do it? And those were some of the tips that they gave me. Let me see if there's anything else in here. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. What is your preferred method and frequency of self-reflection? I mean, I try to self-reflect every, really every evening. I try to play back the whole day. Like what happened today? What went well? What didn't, you know, what could I have done better? I'm not someone who journals, but journaling can be good. What's really been helpful for me is coaching. I have an executive coach and it's really helpful for me to talk through things with him, either interactions that have already happened. Sometimes I talk to him before I have a difficult conversation with somebody to just sort of like get my mind right, get ready. Like, what's my intention? How am I going to go at, at this? Um, so much so that I recently got certified in coaching because it's magic. It's magical. Like the way that it, I, I was telling them, I said, I told them if they say they're not going to pay for my coach anymore, I'm, I'm going to turn in my letter of resignation back then. <laughs> that is that is really how I'm able to self-reflect. This is someone who holds the mirror up for you and helps you kind of sort through things and helps you see things that you might not have seen on your own because we're always so rushed. We're always moving to the next thing. Leadership is a part of our role as clinicians. Thank you for your presentation and best practices on how to be an effective leader. Absolutely, Tracy. Thank you for having me. Any other questions or thoughts, discoveries, excitement? See people with like scrubs and stethoscopes on. You about to go lead? <laughs> of course. <laughs> I love it. All right. Well, thank y'all. I appreciate you being here.